Hello, welcome to my sample video on my presentation covering the topic of investing. I really like this presentation because it's one of my presentations that applies to everyone. If you look at the direction of retirement accounts, especially here in the United States, there are fewer and fewer defined benefit programs and more investor-led accounts. And so it's really important that all of us raise our level of knowledge and understanding of investing so that we can make those wise choices for the future. I also have to admit I had a little bit of a difficult time picking uh, my sample presentation here because I love so many of these topics it was like picking my favorite children but hopefully you'll you'll get the gist from the ones that I have selected and find them beneficial. I should also say that because of this demand for investing advice there's been a, a boom in the business lots of television shows magazines published books written on the subject and a lot of them have their own little hook so I've chosen as mine investing in human nature. It's basically looking at investment decisions through the lens of human nature. And it's my premise that oftentimes our impulses and our intuition or the lessons we've been raised with, can, which might be very useful in other areas of life, can actually be detrimental to making investment decisions. And I'm going to give you a couple of illustrations of how that is. However, I would like to start out by saying what this presentation is not. It is not a get-rich-quick scheme or get-rich-easy scheme. It is not a beat-the-market stock-picking advice presentation. And technically, I myself am not a financial advisor. I am not a Series 7 or a Series 6 uh, licensed advisor. In fact, one of the reasons I got into this area is because I, in my consulting practice, portray myself as a financial analyst. And oftentimes when people at the cocktail party hear that, they hear financial advisor and ask for stock and bond type advice. And I should say, I'm happy to give them that even though it's not what I do professionally. But there are actually advantages to distancing myself from all of those things because getting get rich quick schemes and get rich easy schemes are usually ineffective and are oftentimes con confidence games. And beating the market stock picking advice usually doesn't work. Uh, net of fees, it's very difficult to beat the market. I'll get more into that. And finally, the fact that I am not a financial advisor myself means that I'm not trying to solicit your business to invest with me, which means I might be one of the only unbiased sources of information you get on the topic. Now, I, I do take a lot of pleasure in dispelling some of the common misconceptions about investing, but it's not just a negative what not to do kind of presentation. I do give some proactive advice. Specifically, it is diversified groups of, uh, of, of low fee funds and rebalancing. I can get into what those are live. But it's, uh, it's important to note that, that is a conservative investment presentation. But the fa even if you don't subscribe to that particular school of thought, you'll still find, I think, a lot of my uh, content uh, illuminating nonetheless. Now, in a live presentation, depending on the skill of the audience, I will oftentimes start off with the investment basics, like what a stock and a bond is, and the fu mutual funds, and, and the fees, and a little bit about how the market works, the type of uh, pre-tax, post-tax accounts and, and, and IRAs and Roth IRAs, those kinds of mechanics. I'm going to skip that right now for the sample because I, I think that that's going to be about the same that you'll get from anyone and I wanted to get to some of my more original takes on it. So with that extensive preface, let's get into some of my examples. Um, the first one I wanted to talk about, and again according with, in accordance with the theme of human nature and how it can sometimes lead us astray, I wanted to talk about our optimism. In general, we, we as a society, we as a culture embrace optimism, especially as Westerners. And the Westerners in terms of the Western globe as well as the Western in the United States. And one of the examples of this that we see from research is the fact that they've done surveys and found that about 80% of people believe that they are above average drivers. Now obviously, mathematically speaking, only 50% of people can be above average drivers, but we tend to over uh, we, are, we are overly optimistic about our skills. And that is representative of not just the United States. They've actually done this survey in several countries and several cultures and found that it, it holds about the same regardless of where you do it. There's one notable exception, and that is Japan. They tend to get it right. They're about 50-50. It's not exactly clear why that is. There's probably a commentary on Japanese culture there, but that's not really relevant to what we're doing right now. So when you're so the first thing you have to understand as an investor is you have to accept that you are prone to overestimate your skills in the area. There are some evolutionary biologists who think that this is because human beings developed in times of scarcity and the most optimistic, the most aggressive was the one who got the food and got the girls 
Um, that's a little bit beyond the scope of this presentation, but if, if it helps you to think of it that way, you can. There's also another element of this that makes it particularly difficult when it comes to investing, and that is that markets are not weighted by money. They're, pardon me, not weighted by people. They're weighted by money. In other words, if a hedge fund investor or a professional asset manager has billions of dollars at their disposal, and you only have thousands, or if you're fortunate, millions, you will find that to beat the average, it's not just enough to beat the 50% of the people because some of those people have a super majority, a super vote, because they're playing with more money than you are and the prices are set by the average dollar. And so it's not enough to beat, if you want to beat the market average, you don't just have to beat 50% of the people, you have to beat 50% of the dollars and that might, might mean beating 80 to 90 plus percent of the people. I've never found a good statistic on exactly what that number is, but you should, you should understand it's much higher than just 50%. I think directionally, that's a fair conclusion. And the analogy I oftentimes use is, is basketball. If you think of your neighborhood basketball game, you might think that if you want to win more often against your neighbors or other neighborhoods, you have to practice more. Here's the interesting thing though, about, and to extrapolate that to investing, you might think that if you want to become a smarter investor, you need to study the stocks, study the markets more closely. The interesting thing about the investment products we have now is for relatively low fees, you can get investments that will track the market average. So effectively, it's like you're hiring at a very low price the NBA players to play on behalf of your neighborhood. And I think you'd agree that even if you come home and practice a half hour a night or an hour a night of, of basketball, you're still not going to get up to the point that the pros can. And that's the kind of thing that I would recommend investors bear in mind, is that even if you're watching CNBC and reading Business Week or Barron's, it's still unlikely that you're going to be able to beat the market average that you could for a relatively low fee matched by, by um, just investing in the market in general and getting the help, getting the boost from the NBA players, the, the, the hedge fund pros and the asset managers. So that's a little bit about how our optimism tends to get in our way. And that last analogy is a little bit how that, you know, the, the grandmother's lecture that the, the secret to success is more practice is actually not, is not applicable to a lot of investment decisions. The second example I want to use to illustrate is we as human beings have a lot of difficulty distinguishing the difference between luck and skill. You might have heard the old joke, I'd rather be lucky than good. Well, if you're an investment manager, that, that, that holds true as well as, as well, there as well as anywhere. So let me use an example. If I gave 100 people a coin to flip five times, on average, three of those would get five heads in a row. Now, does that mean that they are better at flipping coins? No, it's cherry picking. You've just selected the ones who are above average. And this is oftentimes what happens with asset managers. They will come to you with the historical performance of their fund, and there's a couple things. First of all, some of the really crooked ones are exaggerating their performance. They're doing the math, they're cheating on the math. Secondly, they also, it's not enough to just do better. It's not enough to just do well. They have to beat a risk-weighted benchmark. So there's a lot of hurdles to, to hit, but even if they're able to beat their risk-weighted benchmarks, some of them might have just gotten lucky. And that's the difference between luck and skill. And some particularly sinister asset management companies They'll, they'll play this fun trick, and I like to pick, pick on a, a lot of the, show you a lot of the tricks of the trade in the industry when I give this presentation. Here's a good example of that. They might open a large number of funds, and then they will select only the ones with good performance to continue selling, and they'll close all the other ones. So in this example, if a fund firm started 100 funds and three of them had 20 plus percent growth every year, they would close the other 97 and then come to you as a customer and say, our asset managers are so good, every fund we sell has 20% plus, uh, uh, plus returns. Now clearly that is, a, that is a, uh, a literally accurate but statement but intended to mislead. That's really not what's happening there. Now you might point out that in my example here, I have deliberately given a coin flip as the, the metaphor and that is completely random, complete chance. And you might say, well look, there probably are some people out there who do have genuine skill. And that's correct, but here's the problem. How would you know? All you know are the results. You can't tell the difference between the luck and the skill. And if you can't tell the difference, it doesn't matter. What will happen is in this scenario, all of the fund managers who had high returns will immediately raise their fees under the implication that you're paying for higher skill. But since you can't tell the difference, 
you might end up paying for luck. And there's no point in paying for luck because it's not predictive. It doesn't necessarily continue. And so what you'll oftentimes end up is paying a higher fee for luck. And that's why I recommend it's best off to just end up sticking with the low fee market averages. And there's a lot of research to back that up. Historical returns are a worse determinant of future performance than low fees. Um, I get a little bit more into that science in the live presentation. The last thing I want to talk about is here I've, I've demonstrated the difference between luck and skill as hiring asset managers. But if you think about it, you, you also face this problem yourself. And I refer to this as the good day gambling phenomenon. Um, oftentimes, I live, I live here in Vegas at the time of this recording, and a lot of people who, uh, who are the, the most eager gamblers are ones who have had one or two big weekends where they made thousands of dollars playing blackjack or they hit it big. And what has happened is they have decided that this is a repeatable event. This is a good way to, to, to make money and have a great weekend. And they have confused luck with skill. And so what do they do? Of course, they go back to the casino the next week and they lose it all back. And then they go back the week after that trying to repeat it and they lose even more. So in a bizarre way, if you like gambling, you're better off always losing because you will never create the illusion, you will never experience the illusion that this can actually work. Now, how does that relate to investing? It's the same thing. Oftentimes, people will pick a handful of stocks and do unusually well, and they will conclude that, stock, that picking stocks is an excellent way to make money. Now, it's important to note, oftentimes they don't do the math of comparing themselves to a risk-weighted benchmark. But let's say, give them the benefit of the doubt and say, even if they beat the market over that period, they, are, they will confuse luck with skill, and they will continue to do that on a forward-going basis and generally fall below the market average because they're not picking necessarily better stocks. And oftentimes, if they're trading frequently, their commissions eat away at their returns. So that's luck versus skill. And for my last topic, one of my favorites, I want to talk about advisors. And I take uh, a great deal of pleasure in, in picking on advisors, and, and they, do, uh, they work very diligently to reinforce my opinion of them. I, I like to point out that I use the analogy of advisors are like Congress. Everybody picks up the newspaper or reads the Wall Street Journal and says, you know, a new investment house has been lying to their clients or cheating their clients or padding their bills, something like that. Lots of insider trading, lots of nefarious things going on. But interestingly, I always say it's like Congress. Con congressional approval at the time of this recording is running about 10%, which is effectively a 90% disapproval rating, except for those handful of undecideds which is very, very low. And yet the majority of Congress people who run again will be reelected. There is a strong incumbency bias in Congress. Now, how can that happen? That's completely illogical. The answer is because we always think it's somebody else's guy who's the problem. If you, if you hear someone talk about Congress, they complain about the wasteful spending and the indulgence and the pork barrel projects. But then if you ask them about their Congress person, so, you know, he or she, they, they, they make sure we get our share. They're in there fighting for us every day. And as a result, w well, we can't all be right now, can we? The truth is that behavior um, it has a biased perspective and that's sort of our human nature. We tend to think that people who are on our side or are closely affiliated with us are doing better than the outsiders, even though they're all effectively doing the same thing. Same thing happens with investment advisors. We like to think that you know, we can read the paper about all these investment houses playing lots of games and doing terrible things, but we always think our advisor is the nice guy because we golf with him every weekend at the country club. And that is a, that's, it's always somebody else. Um, I wanted to extrapolate this to, or, or I should say the challenge I always issue to my audience is if you have an advisor and you trust them because they do a good job, I always say to them, how do you know? Do you know how much they made off of your account last year? Do you know how much of that you paid? And by the way, those aren't necessarily the same numbers because they make a good amount of their profit on kickbacks from investment companies. But my point is, usually you don't know what you're paying them. So you defer to the relationship and say, well, he or she gave my daughter a great graduation gift, very generous. How do you know if it's generous if you don't know what that you paid them? If you paid them thousands of dollars last year and you have two children and each of them gets a $500 graduation gift, yet you're paying them thousands of dollars a year, that's not generous at all. The problem is you don't actually know. And, what ha and as I said here, if the math is hard, because it's very difficult to tell, I mean, they don't exactly tell you, here's how much I made off you last year. And, if it's, and also, you don't necessarily know how effective their performance was. 
it, if you have a portfolio that grew, you might have invested money in it over the years. So you don't actually know the rate of return. Some of that might have just been additions. Likewise, if you're retired, you might be taking money out of that account. So if it shrinks, it might not be performance weighted. And even if some of the companies now provide you with a realized rate of return, calculating for all of those things, it's, um, it's always difficult because you don't know what your risk weighted benchmark would be. So if you made 9%, you don't know if that's good or bad. And I get more into risk evaluation in, in the live presentation, but that's just the, the pr preview for the sample here. So if the math is hard, we tend to defer to the relationships. And here is what I ask you. If you don't know what you're getting from them and you don't know how, you're paying, how much you're paying them, how good of a deal would you expect to get? I mean, if you were buying any other product, let's say you were buying a car, and the salesperson decided what you needed and didn't tell you how much it cost and didn't tell you how good it, wo it was, how good of a deal do you think that salesman would give you? And what people will oftentimes say is, well, you know, that's a car salesman, advisors are, car salesmen have fairly or unfairly a, a, a shady reputation. This is my advisor, I see them frequently. Yes, but if you don't know whether they're doing a good job or not and you don't know how much they're paying them, that actually, seeing them frequently creates more opportunity for them to leverage that relationship, not less. They are allowed to, you know, whereas the car dealer might only get you a few, uh, a few times over your lifetime, once every few years, your advisor can be getting you all day every day and you wouldn't necessarily know about it. And so the last thing I wanna point out, there's one more element of human nature that tends to over apply our confidence in advisors and that is ego. We like to think we're good judges of character and we like to think that we uh, can gauge performance even in ways that we really can't or don't. And as a result of that, we filter the information we get on our advisor. So if there is good information, we assume that that val it's, it's called a confirmation bias. We assume that that validates our good taste. And if it is negative information, we tend to dismiss it or excuse it. And oftentimes our advisor will, will have the ability to to spin that for you. For example, when the markets go up and your portfolio grows, you'll notice your advisor is always reminding you what a great job he or she is doing. However, when markets go down, it's never because they're doing a bad job, it's always, well, that's just the market. And, and the reality is they're, they're, they are selecting sort of whatever suits their best interests and you are, per, you are prone to perceive that as accurate because you want to think that you're right. So anyway, those are some, some of the samples for my investing presentation. I hope you found this informative, and if it's something that's interesting, that interests you, I'd be happy to prepare a proposal for you, and I look forward to doing business with you. Thank you.